Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, week. Who fucking knows of uh, quarantine uh, and uh, another radical history lecture. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the ancient Near East, and um, I'm really excited to do this. Uh, this was one of the topics that I was um, a graduate assistant for, uh, uh, working with the uh, um, esteemed professor, uh, George Armentrout at Portland State University. Uh, I have graded hundreds of essays, um, uh, extremely low effort essays on, on this topic. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to talk about it. I'm, I'm, this is, uh, this and, um, other ancient history topics are, are something that uh, weren't my area of study, but I have a lot of experience with because of that. So, um, I'm going to be talking about mostly Mesopotamia, uh, Sumeria, uh, what one of the authors I read called the cuneiform lands um, in what is now Iraq and Syria, parts of Iran, uh, Turkey, um, the Levant, generally. Um, and yeah, I, I'm very excited. Uh, I'll be watching the chat, as always. Uh, feel free to, to heckle. Please have a drink with me as we uh, delve in to the distant past. So, I ended my um, prehistory lecture by talking by talking about writing. Uh, writing is uh, sort of a useful starting point for actual history. Um, that's where you know when we're talking about the, the history, it, it, it generally begins when you have writing. But I'm actually going to go a little bit before that, because uh, like I mentioned in that lecture, we, we start to see writing emerge around the mid-4th millennium BCE in this part of the world, a little bit later in Egypt, a little bit later in China, uh, but uh, this is definitely the earliest. But uh, it's worth revisiting how writing came about. Um, and to do that, we have to talk about um, commerce. We've talked about money. We have to talk about um, exchange of goods and services. Now, if you were to read uh, a economics textbook, uh, generally they describe the progression towards uh, currency, fiat currency, especially as starting with, uh, in the ancient past, we had um, a primitive barter system and everybody exchanged what they had to each other uh, to acquire what they needed. Um, but that story kind of falls apart as soon as you think about it. Uh, if somebody is raising only sheep, uh, you can't trade, you know, a quarter of a sheep or parts of a sheep for, you know, the grain that you need or a new hoe or, you know, a wheel for your wagon. Um, and very few civilizations or societies actually operated like that. Um, how it actually tended to develop is um, up to a certain point, uh, <laughs> you're right. You could if you wanted to. Uh, it just doesn't work very well on a large scale. Uh, what what tended to happen is that up to a certain uh, size of society, uh, there was a, a form of primitive communism. People just shared things in common. Property was held by the group. We're talking tribes and, and small villages. Um, you would not, uh, if in a group of you know 10 or 12 or 20 people, uh, be a dick and let them starve because they didn't have something to pay you with, Right. You had to, you know, you, you gave what you needed. People kept sort of an idea of what they owed or had sort of a very uh, vague sense of, of debt or obligation uh, that held this together. When it got complicated was when you needed to trade with the next group over, when, with, when you needed, when your, um, when your community got too big, then you needed to develop more sophisticated forms of uh, transaction, of, uh, of debt and credit. And that meant developing things like a lot of communities, a lot of people developed something like a tally stick where you would snap that in half and one side would have, you know, a re record of um, what was owed and the other side would have a, a matching record or something like that. And what you're seeing here is a, a very early form of proto-cuneiform. Um, the, the form of writing that emerged in Sumeria. And these, the, the very early proto-writing was simply uh, a way of recording um, 
what was owed, what was given to people. Um, uh, it was it was essentially an accounting mechanism. This is uh, some sort of uh, record of sheep and or grain given uh, at some point in the early fourth millennium. Um, it seems like for a few hundred years, people uh, mostly priests belonging to the official you know cults of these city states had been recording. Uh, using these as sort of like a way to remember things, right? Uh, if you were dealing with large volumes of goods, it was pretty difficult without writing them down to know what you had. And so that is sort of the the, the origin of cuneiform, of, of first writing, is uh, a, a way to record uh, debts, exchanges, uh, essentially an accounting system. Um, it's not sexy, but it's true. That's that's where writing came from. It was a way to make sure that everybody got paid. Um, these early proto cuneiforms were um, pictographic, uh, so we don't really know what they say. We can just kind of guess. Later cuneiform is actually a writing system, uh, and it can be uh, translated. Like this one. Uh, this is what uh, cuneiform looks like. This is... <laughs> rude um, <laughs> damn it um this is um this is cuneiform this is a uh, a tablet which um records the uh, contract for the sale of a field and a house um it, it you know it has all of the witnesses involved and all of the amounts etc who was there when it happened um and this this cuneiform was called so, right, this is, uh, this form of writing was developed by pressing the, the wedge-shaped end of a reed into uh, clay tablets. Um, the word cuneiform comes from cuneus, Latin word for wedge. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. I learned uh, this week, uh, or I was reminded this week, that mortgage, mortgage, mortgage literally translates to, uh, to death pledge. Uh, anyway, um, that's, that's what you're getting into when you buy a house. What was I saying? All right. Um, so we have a lot of these tablets. And uh, as you might imagine, uh, the fact that this writing system was pressed into a tablet of clay uh, is very useful for archaeologists and historians. Uh, we have a lot of these left over because they were preserved, especially if uh, the city happened to burn down, which happened with alarming frequency in the ancient world. So we have tens of thousands of these cuneiform tablets from all throughout this time period, uh, and the vast majority of them are accounting related. They are just uh, full of exchanges and transactions and debts and goods owed and um, all these uh, wonderful, exciting things. Oh, 15% of these early ones are just lexicographical. They're just uh, wordless. Uh, they burned because uh, everything was made out of wood, and uh, people didn't. People had to burn things for fuel, and there were no uh, fire brigades. It's just a an incredible, unfortunate truth that in the pre-modern period, really, uh, your house burning down was a, a very, very common occurrence. Um, it was just going to happen. Um, well into the nineteenth and twentieth century, um, I'll get to social services. Um, so these people, uh, these people, the very early writers of cuneiform spoke Sumerian. It's a language isolated. It's not related to any of our current languages in any serious way. But we have a pretty good understanding of it because of all of these uh, cuneiform tablets. Um, and one of the first places where uh, this sort of developed and became uh, significant was a place called Uruk. Uh, which is uh, in, uh, on, as all the places I'm going to talk about tonight are uh, on the Tigris or Euphrates River um, in what is now called the Fertile Crescent. And uh, during this period, during this is what we're calling the, the Bronze Age, uh, the ancient Near East was dominated by city states Uruk, uh, Ur, Babylon, Nippur, um, Uma, etc. And the first, the biggest of these at the beginning, very early, and we're talking. Uh, 3500 BCE was Uruk, uh, located in Iraq. Uh, it had been settled uh, as early as 5000 BCE, but it became sort of a regional power around uh, 3200. 
So all these city-states had their own patron god, and the priests of these deities formed uh, elaborate systems of exchange, trade, and sacrifice, and so the, the temples were <laughs> centers of, of governance and commerce. Uh, they were the, the sort of the, the core of the city and the, um, the temple complex to the god of Aruk, uh, Inanna, or Ayana, um, later, uh, who, uh, who you may know as a later incarnationist, Ishtar, um, were the, the leaders of Rook. Um, uh, they were responsible for these very detailed and complex bureaucratic systems of organization and accounting for sort of the core of these early states. Uh, interestingly, this early, what is called the Rook period, Rook III, um, had no king um, or hereditary leadership at all. It seems that the priests and priestesses were nominally in charge. Uh, that is not to say that there, the society was equal. Uh, there were already wealthy merchants and landholders, um, but the inequality, inequality hadn't become stratified. Uh, kings came later. Um, and uh, interestingly, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, these priests of um, Inanna. Uh, these, they were called uh, Gala, explicitly, and they had neither female nor male identities. Um, the priests appear to have been... Uh, both uh, cisgender men and women who dressed as, took the roles of, and performed the sexual responsibilities of either men or women as the ritual or ceremony called for. Um, later Ish incarnations of Ishtar, uh, her cult expanded on this, uh, believing that the ceremonial dances transformed the men uh, into women. Um, there was an element of um, ceremonial or holy prostitution involved in the priestesses of Ishtar. It's unclear what exactly they did and how often, but it was uh, a part of sort of the um, the city cult of this goddess uh, to uh, travel to the, the temple and have sex with or some sort of sexual encounter with a priest or priestess. Um, women held an interesting position relatively uh, <laughs> in ancient Sumeria. Uh, they could, for the most part, uh, represent themselves in court, own and purchase property, uh, work, uh, again, most often as innkeepers or weavers, uh, and the priestesses uh, held significant power, uh, especially in places like um, Uruk. Now, that's not to suggest that uh, ancient Sumer was some kind of egalitarian paradise. Uh, for example, the punishment for female adultery was far more severe than, the, than that for men, but sexuality and gender were not as stratified as they would become in later societies. Uh, homosexuality wasn't by itself... Um, all that big of a deal. Uh, it was uh, a, a different kind of um, gender and sexual structure than you would see, especially in ancient Rome or Greece. Um, oops. Oh, no, I wanted that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the Tigris and Euphrates. This is These are the, the rivers that uh, all of these place, places uh, are where... Um, they the this this fertile crescent where all of these early civilizations uh, popped up. Um, uh, anything I say that is false, uh, you didn't hear it from me. Uh, that's a lie, uh, slander. Um, nobody nobody can hold me accountable for anything that I say here. So the Tigris and Euphrates again. You heard this area called the Fertile Crescent, and um, and rightfully so. This area was very productive. What made this such a good area for early civilization was the predictability of these river systems. Every year when the snow in Anatolia's uh, mountains would melt, uh, the rivers would flood, depositing silt and making the irrigation systems built by these early Sumerians possible. There was a reliability to uh, every year, and you could uh, plan by harvests a lot more easily than you could in other parts of the world. Uh, there were plenty of relatively sophisticated societies um, in other parts of the Near East but they relied on rainfall or um, or irrigation systems that wouldn't be practical until later um, in uh, after you know more sophisticated sophisticated techniques had traveled to them. There was an ability in around the Tigris and Euphrates to to rely on and not be um, quite so subject to natural disasters or floods or droughts or bad kind of floods. Good fun, good floods like the Tigris and Euphrates were reliable. And that made these civilizations very stable. Uh, you're going to notice that I'm going to talk about th about 3,000 years um, from the, you know, the beginning of the Uruk period to, you know, the Neo-Babylonian period. That is uh, quite a lot of time. Um, and many of these civilizations 
uh, existed, or these kingdoms existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, far longer than uh, any state uh, or most states that exist now. Um, these were very, very, for the most part, stable societies, and in a lot of places, a very wealthy and very generous states. Speaking of floods and gods, uh, time period, we're still talking about around 3200 BCE for Uruk. Um, and uh, after the initial period in Uruk, um, around 2900 BCE, um, the people of Uruk decided that they liked kings after all. Uh, what? Oh, what is time? Oh, I don't know. Uh, time has no meaning. Um, around 2900 BCE, they decided they liked kings after all, and they developed a hereditary monarchy. Um, one of the first of these was a king called Gilgamesh, who you have probably... Egypt is a thing at this time. Uh, actually, I should talk about that. Um, I really wanted to talk about Egypt... Um, as a uh, in in a relation to this, but I can't because I uh, do not have time. But uh, this actually, I wanted to point out. This is from around 3200 BCE. This is a, a an image of a, a of a king of Uruk. It's from Egypt. Uh, it is a um, it is the the hilt of a knife, uh, indicating some sort of trade and relationship between Egypt and. Um, the kings of Sumeria. So there was uh, contact and trade, and um, I'll try to point it out, but um, this is yeah around the time of some of the largest uh, Egyptian kingdoms. So anyway, Gilgamesh. Sorry, we're talking about Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh was one of the kings of uh, the early dynastic period of Uruk. Uh, you may have heard of him from his uh, eponymous epic, which was passed down like the Iliad by oral tradition and written down later. Um, if you haven't read it, I recommend you do. It's really good. Ostensibly, it's about Gilgamesh trying to find a way to become immortal. But at its heart, it's just an amazing dude's rock story about Gilgamesh and his bro and Kidu getting drunk, going hunting, and trying to get laid. Uh, it is it is a, a bromance for the ages. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. Um, and at the end, Gilgamesh decides that he doesn't want to be immortal and, um, you know, is happy with being king of Uruk. Uh, famously, the Epic of Gilgamesh contains a familiar-sounding flood myth uh, about uh, Up Upishtanim, um, you know, building a boat and surviving and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, suggesting that there's some sort of... Um, some sort of... Uh, you know, great flood myth among the, the many, you know, all of these uh, Near East peoples. Um, listen, uh, The Prince of Egypt is a really good movie. Great cartoon. Uh, does not fairly <laughs> depict the Egyptians. In fact, I'm not even going to be able to talk about this, but I, 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 I talked about this in another lecture, but um, the uh, Israelites did not build the pyramids and they, uh, the whole slavery in Egypt thing is a real gray area. Well, I, I'll try to address that at, at a later point. Anyway, um, so Gilgamesh, uh, from around 200, 2900 to 2300 BCE, Uruk is ruled by, in this early dynastic period, by a series of kings. Um, it's, again, pretty stable, 700 years or so, 800, 600 years. Um, and, uh, I want to take another, like, quick, is that right? Yeah, quick, uh, detour to talk again about debt. Um, so debt was essential to the functioning of the Sumerian economy. Money could be lent at a rate of... Um, 20% uh, at a certain points, later grain at 33%, um, and debt peonage was common. It was it was relatively frequent that somebody uh, would get themselves into essentially debt slavery or debt peonage uh, because ordinary people didn't have any money, so they would um, go into debt to do anything of consequence. But throughout this period, uh, the kings of Mesopotamia would proclaim a masharum, or redress, which would cancel all debts and free all slaves. Uh, they did this... Uh, generally when a new king took the throne, but sometimes as often as every 10 years during particularly um, unequal or um, you know poor periods. Um, it's likely... Uh, this is, sorry, this is the... Um, I'm going to get to this. This is the... Uh, it's likely that the biblical concept of Jubilee draws from this tr tradition, um, where every, what's every seven years or something? Uh, uh, it's in Leviticus. I don't remember. But this is the um, Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone, among other things, uh, you've probably heard of this, but one of the things included... Uh, thank you, Mom. Every 49 years. Um, 
the Rosetta Stone, uh, among other things, uh, confirms that debts were canceled by uh, Ptolemy V um, in 162 or something like that. So this it, it, that was a a practice that had been adopted by um, Egyptian pharaohs and then later the Ptolemies, um, based on this practice of forgiving debts every you know every so often. Um, and this again, I think that this uh, lent itself to the stability of the the period. People could put up with a certain level of, of poverty and inequality and even uh, servitude if they knew that the next time there was a king or, you know, every 10 years, uh, everything would be forgiven. However, um, things didn't uh, stay the same forever. And uh, after um, the sort of early dynastic period of Uruk, a new fellow came along. Uh, and the old city-states were sort of unceremoniously uh, overturned by a hot new upstart, this guy, Sargon of Akkad. Um, you may have heard of him. He's a, a pretty um, significant person. Um, also, a truly abysmal British YouTuber has taken the name Sargon of Akkad, so if you search for him, you'll end up with him. His real name is Carl Benjamin, and he's a real awful person. Anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, dis so, we know that he was Akkadian, uh, and that he ruthlessly con conquered Uruk, Ur, uh, and most of the other Sumerian city-states in the Near East, as well as the kingdoms of Kish and Alam uh, in Iran and, and what is now Turkey, relatively. Uh, the Akkadians were a Semitic people, um, and there had been some cultural intermixing, intermixing with the Sumerians before Sargon's conquest, but that really uh, kicked into high gear. And there was... Uh, uh, it seems like most... Sumerians at this time period were, or especially the elites, I guess, the the, uh, the scribes and the priests were somewhat bilingual. They, they spoke Akkadian and Sumerian and their cuneiform tablets with both languages on them. Um, Sargon's empire didn't last very long. It, it fell apart during the reign of his fourth successor, but the whole idea of an empire, uh, people decided they liked that, or rather people who were going to be doing their conquering decided they liked that. It stuck with it. Sargon had conquered what was essentially the first empire in recorded history in that he ruled over sort of a multi-ethnic coalition state. Um, after his collapse, the collapse of his empire, the Semitic-speaking peoples divided into two rough national identities, Assyria and Babylonia. Um, which brings us to Babylon. Um, around the turn of the second millennium, uh, this city-state of Babylon, which had initially been a small Akkadian town, uh, grew into a massive metropolis. It was possibly the first city to reach a population above 200,000. Uh, estimates for its maximum extent were as high as 200 and, or sorry, 2,200 acres. Um, its walls and uh, hanging gardens were renowned the world over. Uh, Herodotus said, uh, in magnificence, there is no other city that approaches it. Uh, he had never been there, but uh, I think we can trust him otherwise. Um, its most spectacular period came later, but it began there. Um, that tower is a ziggurat, actually, um, and this is a, a later painting, so they didn't do a good job of depicting a ziggurat, but there was a very large and famous ziggurat at the center of, um, of Babylon. It might also be the Tower of Babel. Uh, Babylon is often associated with that, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but you probably know Babylon best for... Hammurabi, um, again, somebody you've probably heard of. Uh, he wasn't the first king of Babylon, but he was definitely the most famous. Uh, he conquered widely and declared himself overlord of several other city-states. Uh, what you almost certainly know him for, if you know him at all, is for his code of laws, the code of Hammurabi, which you can see carved here. That eye for an eye stuff, these laws weren't actually concerned all that much with violent crime. Uh, they were mostly about property, ownership, marriage, divorce, uh, contractual stuff. Uh, again, the tedious day-to-day -day stuff that ordinary people have to deal with. Um, they were laid down, according to Hammurabi, in order that the mighty might not wrong the weak to provide just ways for the waif and the widow. Um, the, uh, the laws also include sort of the first idea of a presumption of innocence and an opportunity for the accuser and the accused to present evidence. Um... However, unlike his code of laws, Hammurabi's empire was also short-lived and soon replaced by another dynasty of kings from elsewhere in Babylonia. Um, 
this next sort of late Bronze Age period, sort of 1500 BCE to around uh, 1150, is called just sort of the Late Bronze Age. And it's marked by the emergence of some new groups of people, uh, the Hatti or the Hittites, um, a group of people from Anatolia who spoke an early Indo-European Indo language, and the Mitanni, a group of people from uh, parts of Syria who spoke uh, Hurrian. Uh, they clashed with the Mesopotamian, ki Mesopotamian kings, but none of them really formed, uh, took over the whole area. They, they sort of uh, shared power. It was a relatively peaceful period where the kings of, of Babylon, Mitanni, Hatti, and other areas traded uh, and widely and had robust di diplomatic relations with uh, the kings or pharaohs of Egypt, um, Cyprus, Greece, Crete, uh, elsewhere. Uh, merchants and ambassadors traveled for hundreds of miles to trade, exchange letters, and share ideas. Uh, there's lots of, of really interesting correspondence between different monarchs of this area of this era. You know, uh, they married each other's um, daughters and shared power and traded uh, extensively. Um, wrote, uh, "Hello, brother. How are you doing over there in Egypt?" Uh, blah blah blah. It was um... oh, interesting. Um, I think that's probably valid. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the code says, but, uh, the truth is that this, that, that uh, from what I can tell, Babylon and Hammurabi was not a, um, I mean, it was, these are commercial city-states, you know, uh, it's, um, a severe capital punishment for everything while being a good deterrent was potentially not... Uh, practical or enforceable. So I think it's entirely valid that it's a mistranslation or a misunderstanding of what the actual punishment would have been. Um, anyway, late Bronze Age period, relatively peaceful, lots of different kingdoms. Um, but then come the Sea Peoples. Um, and uh, this is probably not what they looked like. I don't have any idea what they looked like, but uh, I wanted to use some cool art. So uh, this is what uh, what you're going to imagine for the Sea Peoples. So around the 12th century BCE, a group of seafaring refugees and soldiers from somewhere in the Mediterranean uh, began raiding up and down the eastern Mediterranean. Archaeologi archaeologists, excuse me, and historians still kind of argue about where these people might have come from and who they were. Uh, they probably came from somewhere in the Aegean, maybe... Um, and, uh, do not apologize for the distraction. That is the whole point of these lectures. Uh, I, I, that is literally what they're here for. Um, they may have been Greeks. They may have been Mycenaeans. They may have been, uh, a, a combination. They were, it's generally believed they were some group of refugees or soldiers or mercenaries from somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, but wherever they came from, their impact was notable. Um, not, it's not the only reason, but uh, the Hittite, Mitanni, and Mycenaean kingdoms all collapsed shortly after invasions by the Sea Peoples, and Egypt was split in two for a period. Um, the invasion by the Sea Peoples is, is well recorded in uh, Egyptian uh, steles and um, hieroglyphics. Uh, one group of Sea Peoples, the Peleset, settled in the southern Levant and gave their name to the region uh, Palestine. Um, you may be asking yourself, Rob, are the Sea Peoples Atlanteans from the uh, continent of Atlantis, which sunk to the sea. And I'm going to say, I can't tell you one way or another, but uh, I'll leave it to you to decide. Um, so for about 150 years, uh, the nobody was really in power in the Near East. Uh, everything was all up in the air, uh, what with the sea peoples and some climate changes. Uh, but don't worry, that state of affairs wasn't going to last very long. <clears throat> um... The Assyrians had not forgotten uh, that they had once ruled a great um, swath of the Near East, and they rose again to prominence, reconquering everything they had, and then more. Um, in in it, this uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire started around the the ninth century BCE, um, and uh, reached its height under. Ashurbanipal, uh, who you can see here, uh, killing a lion like a, a cool dude does. Um, just uh, just stabbing that lion. Um, 
he conquered a massive area that included Iran, Iraq, Syria, much of modern-day Turkey, and most of Egypt. It was far and away the largest empire, four times larger than any that had come before. Um, the Assyrians were interesting. They had, uh, for the time period, advanced military technology, uh, better bows, which they favored chariots, uh, siege weapons like uh, battering rams and towers, um, and advanced tactics. Uh, one, one Assyrian special was uh, they would dam a river upstream from a city with walls and then let the water accumulate and then breach the dam so it would uh, crash and um, flood the city, destroy the walls. Um, Ashurbanipal, this guy here, uh, in addition to being a, a warrior and conqueror, considered himself quite the scholar. Liked to brag about how much he had read and how good he was at math and all of the things that he had read. He liked to have philosophers over to um, talk uh, philosophy and uh, have arguments. Uh, he, he considered himself quite the intellectual. Um, and as such, he gathered himself a massive library at Nineveh, which contained tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets, including a copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we uh, we now have thanks to um, Ashurbanipal. Uh, so even though he was, by all accounts, a bloodthirsty tyrant and conqueror, thank you, Ashurbanipal, for collecting all of those cuneiform tablets so that a... Um, a uh, snotty British archaeologist could discover them in the 19th century and uh, reveal that knowledge to us. Um, as is probably no surprise to you, at this point, uh, the Assyrian Empire, Neo-Assyrian Empire, didn't last. And next up were was the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Um, now, uh, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you've probably heard of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, who you are seeing here, uh, one of the greatest kings of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Um, I could have included another uh, statue, but I, I wanted to grab uh, the kind of sweet-ass paintings that were in the Bibles that I read when I was a kid. So this is a, a picture of Nebuchadnezzar uh, trying to burn uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in the fiery furnace, but they are unburned. Um, anyway, um, even though he's mostly known for his uh, his prominence in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar was actually a builder uh, uh, and uh, uh, spent a lot of time beautifying and building up um, Babylon. He uh, beautified its walls, its temples, hanging gardens, and uh, the massive ziggurat at the center. Um, he really like put a shine on Babylon, and it probably reached its greatest height. <laughs> It's greatest height at um, at this time. Um, so it thrived under Nebuchadnezzar and his successors, especially the uh, Nabonidus, uh, a couple of generations later. But um, it was not built to last either, because uh, during the reign of a good Nabonidus uh, appeared a new conqueror, uh, this time coming from the east, calling himself Cyrus and leading a people called the Persians. Um... Cyrus, whose empire stretched from the Indus River to the uh, <laughs> uh, Nebuchadnezzar, indeed, um, uh, whose empire stretched from the Indus River to the fuck, I really like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, river, uh, Indus to the Bosphorus, blah, blah, blah. Um, he defeated the Babylonians, uh, took control of the region, and uh, ended Mesopotamia independence for generations. This is him uh, receiving the uh, the fealty of Astyaxes, I think. It's, uh, I, again, I wanted to get some different art. This is... Uh, uh, people loved... Uh, Renaissance painters loved to paint Cyrus. Um, ending the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian independence for generations. Uh, Akkadian and Sumerian fell out of use. Um, and until we started... Uh, digging up these clay tablets uh, were largely lost to history. Um, these uh, empires were uh, were essentially forgotten or or buried or or barely remembered even by the people who lived there for a long, long time. And I I, I want to go back to the time periods involved here. So around the time of um, of Gilgamesh, right, uh, 2500 BC. Uh, am I being Mesopotamian? Um, Around the time of Gilgamesh, uh, you know, 
2500 years uh, BCE. Uh, that's around the time when Ramesses II builds his Great Pyramids. So I know this isn't going to be news to anybody, but for example, uh, Cleopatra lived closer in time to us than she did to the building of the pyramids. Um, and when uh, Nabonidus uncovered the, uh, you know, the ruins of Babylon and Naram Sim, those were 1,200 years old. That would have been ancient history to Nabonidus, who is ancient history to us. And that's one of the reasons why I really like talking about the ancient Near East and, and Sumeria, is just to give an impression of just the absolute vastness of human history. Um, there were also many, many complex societies in this region uh, who uh, were interesting and complex and had their own art and creations uh, that we know nothing about because they didn't stamp things on clay tablets. Um, Nabon or, um, Ashurbanipal himself had thousands and thousands and thousands of scribes, but they wrote things down on uh, tablets of wax. So the only things that we recall from his time period are that which was recorded on those clay tablets. Um, anyway, um, that's my lecture on uh, the ancient Near East. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for listening. Uh, if you have questions, you have about a minute before I stop talking to ask them. Um, I'm going to... Um, save this. I'm going to upload it on YouTube so that uh, hopefully people who missed it can watch it. Um, I am working on setting up uh, a, an email, but you can always respond to my weekly emails uh, if you have thoughts about this or requests. I think next week I'm going to revisit one of my favorite books, The Many-Headed Hydra, and talk about some exciting um, radical uh, revolutionary American history, but we'll see. We'll see how motivated I am. Um, so anyway, thank you and, uh, have a great evening. Stay inside, stay safe. Uh, I love you all. Good night.